Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Alice Cooper grew up in the Bicker Tonight Church and went by the name Vinny, my cousin Vinny. In our next conversation with Dr. Daniel Stone, we'll learn that Vinny's grandfather was actually president of the Bicker Tonight Church. Who knew? We'll also learn more about Alice Cooper's life. Check out our conversation. I also want to remind everybody, please sign up for our newsletter. Go to gospeltangents.com slash newsletter, and you can learn some inside scoops and, and fun stuff. So check it out. Now back to our conversation. Well, then we, we need to talk about the, the most famous speaker tonight, uh, Alice Cooper. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So John, John Henry gave us a little taste of that. So can you give us any more details on that? Sure. Okay. The, people always ask about this, and it's fun. I have never met Alice Cooper, unfortunately. Growing up, I was in a garage rock and roll band called... Oh, really? oh yeah, I loved it. We were the Rockaway Fumes and played all throughout college. I love rock and roll, especially garage rock and roll. I grew up listening to Alice Cooper. Um, I loved his songs, but uh, I, and I didn't find out until later he was a bicker tonight, and I was like, oh, man! <laughs> yeah, well, and I have to tell you, I know you're, you're younger than me, but when I was in high school... People would say, Alice Cooper's a Mormon, and I was like, oh, whatever. And so when John Hamer told me that there was you know, a little bit of truth for that, I was like... Yeah, I saw that interview you did with him. It was really yeah. good. Yeah, so Alice Cooper grew up in the Bicker Tonight Church. He, he never was baptized in the church, as far as I know. I don't believe he was. Um, but his, fa- his father was an evangelist. His name was Ether. We say, we, as Bicker Tonight, we say Ether, but I know other people say Ether. ether. Okay. So it was Ether Furnier was his father's name, and he was an evangelist. It was Ether Moroni Furnier. Yeah, it was. It was. His middle name was Moroni. It's Mormon can you do? I know. It was to- like totally. And, and, and Alice Cooper's real name is Vincent Furnier, and people yeah. called him Vinny. Yeah. So, and then his father. Cousin Vinny. No. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And his grandfather's name was. Uh, uh, um, Thurman Furnier, okay. who was not only an apostle, but at one time was the president of the church. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So, you, and, and, and at that point, they, the presidents weren't considered prophets. They were okay. just considered presidents of the church. Okay. So that, the prophethood kind of, of leading the church kind of pretty much died away with William Bickerton. Some people saw William Cadman as, could have maybe conceived Cadman as a prophet, or even his son, William H., uh, but... It, it's not, it wasn't, it, that wasn't not like an official thing for the most, I'd have to go look more into it and get into it, but it wasn't as official as William Bickerton was. That kind of dies away, that official stance after William Bickerton. And, and just, to, just one other thing, I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, that's why I want to ask, do you, do, does your church believe that Joseph Smith was the first prophet? Or do you, do you trace him back to that? Yeah, our, our roots go back to Joseph Smith. When we do talk about it, because the Bicker Tonight's they're very scriptural based. Very rarely do we get into the history. We've actually, we used to talk more about the history than we do. There's several books written in the 70s and 80s, especially by this one apostle named Leonard Lavavo, was really into the restoration. And actually, this is interesting, this is kind of leading things out. The church is really now trying to, there's this movement where we're trying to get back into the restoration, into the history. Um, but, you know, it's hard because people don't really know it. So, we, 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 we know our roots are there, but we don't often talk about it as much as we probably should talk so you about don't it. talk about Joseph Smith at all? Very rare. Like sometimes we do, but very rarely. It depends on which branch you go to. Um, mm-hmm. My branch, once in a while, talks about it. The branch I grew up in in South Florida, because I'm a transplant, I'm now, I've only been in Michigan for six years, we talked about it. That's why I kind of got into history. I had one elder that really talked about it quite a bit. He was a historian, but... Um, or he, you know, he got his bachelor's degree in history. Really loved history. So Joseph was a pretty minor character in history. Yeah, pretty much because of the fact that nobody can really pinpoint that we just. Most people say he's a fallen prophet. Some people in my church don't even think he's a prophet. Oh, really? Yeah, they say that, and that's kind of they say he was a tool used in the hand of God. Where I'm trying to say, no, 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 he was a prophet. He had the seer stones. If we believe in the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Mormon says that whoever has these stones is called a seer. Who had the stones? Who translated the Book of Mormon? That's a prophetic gift. Like you just, you, there's, you ask any scholar of American religion, you can't even. You don't even have to believe in Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was an American prophet. You can't say he wasn't. So that's to me, that's my argument. Some people, I have close friends where we kind of go back and forth. So it's nothing against them. But I'm like, no, he was a prophet. He 
He, he, he possessed these prophetic gifts. Whether we believe or, or disagree, he's considered historically as a prophet. So if you believe in the restoration, you have to believe Joseph Smith was a prophet at some point, or else how did the Book of Mormon come forth? He, I mean, he, he had to be a seer to translate according to the Book of Mormon. So if you're going to believe the Book of Mormon is divine scripture, then you have to accept the fact that Joseph Smith was a prophet. There's no, there's no getting around that. Okay. <laughs> so, and I had heard that Sidney Rigdon was the second prophet. Is that true or not? Yeah, they, it depends on who you ask. Oh, it, really? Some people will say, well, our line goes through Sidney Rigdon, and that's true. William Bickerton did say that. But really, the, the hinging point of William Bickerton is the vision of the mountain and chasm. Okay. That is where the authority of the church, yeah, the, the authority of the line, laying out of hands to the original keys of the kingdom of like the Mormon movement under Joseph Smith are believed to be drawn from Sidney Rigdon. But the calling of God, really, as William Bickerton, as a prophet, to basically be leading his new movement comes from that vision of the mountain and chasm and also from that, uh, that revelation as the Church of Alma because he basically that, that uh, symbolism of like he stood alone and he's starting the church over from scratch being a priest, uh, being a, you know, a, the priest of a bad ruler, King Noah and Brigham Young. So, <laughs> so. Okay. Because what I've heard was that, that William Bickerton was the third and last. Is that, is that yeah, it depends on who you ask. Most people would say that. And, that, and, and, and you could say technically, they would probably back that up by scripture saying, well, prophets all throughout the te all the scripture have been called to like renew movements, right? So like Moses renewed the movement or, you know, um, several prophets like Jesus was not only the Messiah, but this great prophet that renewed the movement. So they would look at William Bickerton kind of in that similar sense, not to say that he's Jesus, but that, that he's a prophet that was given extreme power to renew the movement. And, and, and he was even had the power to ordain apostles, which some people in the Bickertonite church would say, prophets are below apostles. Well, William Bickerton was a prophet who ordained apostles. He wasn't called an apostle. He eventually was called an apostle later on, but when he ordains a quorum of 12, he wasn't. He was called a prophet. So it kind of throws that chink in the chain where you say, well, wait a minute. Can a prophet ordain apostles if you believe prophets are below apostles? In the Bicker Tonight Church, a lot of people say prophets are below apostles. Oh, really? Yeah, but that's not – but you can still – Bickerton is a prophet who ordains apostles. So it shows, at least through history, and if you want to tie that in scripturally, Bickerton kind of act in a way – I don't want to say he was Jesus, but he started a movement and restored the movement and obviously – if, if you're a bicker tonight, you have to believe that he had the power to do that and to ordain apostles. So it's, it's little interesting mental well, gymnastics that we play. I just wonder if that's because cause the Cadman narrative is what went out, right? Yep, exactly. So, so he would probably try to push prophets below apostles because he was an apostle and he wanted to be the top of the church. Oh, for sure. And so it, it doesn't sound like... And he could even have been considered a prophet necessarily, but he still was an apostle and the president first. Yeah. yeah. So, so you got the, so the apostle, so the president of the Quorum of Twelve. So you guys kind of followed the Brigham Young movement, and the, the the president of the Quorum of Twelve becomes the president of the church. Exactly. Yep. It's, it's a, kind of we switch it. So this is an interesting story. So under William Bickerton, you had a first presidency. You had the prophet, first and second counselor, and then you have the twelve. And so you and William Bickerton and his first and second counselors in the 1860s will eventually be considered apostles too, but that's after they ordained a quorum of twelve. So so they'll eventually be, they'll be considered apostles, and then you have the twelve. Well, when the church splits up and they come back together, when they reorganize in 1904, and you know they reordain a new quorum of twelve, because when the church comes back together, William Cadman Sr. was the only apostle. <laughs> there were no more apostles, and because William Bickerton was no longer the prophet and leader, so they have to reorganize the quorum in 1904. So he's really a lot like Brigham Young. Yeah, exactly, in a, a very similar sense. Yeah, so he um, they ordain a new quorum of twelve in 1904, but this time Cat, William Cadman Sr. puts the presidency within the twelve. Okay. So, you, so you'll have only 12 apostles, and then there will be a presidency within the 12 that will be called as president and first and second counselor, but there's, but there's still apostles. So there's no three above the 12. So it's just 12. It's not 12 plus three. Yeah, exactly. There's no, there's no 12 plus three until the next president takes over, Alexander Cherry, who then brings the three back above the 12. 
<laughs> and then I believe in the 1970s, I don't remember the exact date, I have to look more into it with my research, which I plan on writing about eventually later. In the 1970s, I believe it is, and there's talk in the 60s to move it out because they're like, wait, we got 15 apostles, we're not sure if this is scriptural or not. There's that debate within the Bicker Tonight movement. I know within other you know, Latter-day Saint movements that's not a problem, but within us it was. So in the 70s, they basically, I believe it's the 70s, they say, okay, they eventually let the apostles die out, and then they eventually just made a quorum of 12 again. And then they brought the, they brought the presidency back within the 12. So we've been switching back and forth throughout our history. <laughs> so anyway, I didn't mean to get a sidetrack there. We're going to go back to Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper. Okay, so, so Alice Cooper's grandfather was Thurman. Thurman Fernier. Thurman Fernier, and who was apostle and at one time a president for a little bit. And then um, do they serve for life or just... To- no, until uh, they have a, they have a term. I'm not sure what the term was back then, if it's the same as today. But they do have they have a term, and it was elected within the quorum. That's how it, that's how they eventually did it. Um, what's interesting is so Will, Alice Cooper or Vincent Fernier grew up true blue Bickertonite. Was never baptized, as far as I know. I don't think he was. Did you but, baptize at age eight? No, we have a believer's baptism. Not to say that eight years old can't you don't believe, but we say. Uh, I've heard instances where people as young as eight were baptized or nine or ten, but it's not common. It's very uncommon. Um, but what they'll say is usually they call it the age of accountability. There's no exact age for that. Joseph Smith put that at eight. Um, William Bickerton, it doesn't really seem when he puts the age of accountability, even though he talks about it. William Bickerton actually believed children were members of the church until they reached this uncertain age of accountability. They could even take sacrament. <laughs> which was interesting. But then once they reached this age of accountability, they had to get baptized in order to do sacrament. The Bickertonites don't do that anymore. You just have to reach this certain age where maybe like 12, 13, 14, and onward. That usually seems to be the earliest age. We have rare instances where you're younger. But usually 12 and up, I've seen on a normal basis that you can believe and you realize, you know, I'm old enough to recognize right from wrong. And you say, I want to get baptized. And then they do it. So And that's been the way it is today. So... Alice Cooper never did that. But okay. I know a few people growing, now that I'm in the Detroit area, which is where Alice grew up, or Vincent grew up, yeah, um, I know several people that grew up with him and knew him and even knew him out in the West because eventually uh, Vincent's family, the Furniers, moved to uh, Arizona, which I believe, don't quote me, but I believe that's where his band eventually you know, gains more momentum. And people that I remember, even my father-in-law even remembers Vinny a little bit and says, you know, he always kind of dressed a little different, you know. He, and, and good for Alice. He always wanted to be that different person. I can relate to that. I was always like that and kind of looked at weird. I had like the jean jacket with the patches. So sometimes I, I have a kindred spirit with Alice on that. <laughs> but yeah, Alice was like that and, or Vincent was like that. And eventually what ends up happening is he moves to Arizona. Fun, this is the funny story. So he... Uh, he writes no. So this is one of my favorite songs growing up in high school. It was "No More Mr. Nice Guy," right? And there's this lyric within "No More Mr. Nice Guy" that says, "I believe it goes, I went to church incognito and everybody rose, and Mr. Smithy recognized me and punched me in the nose, saying, "No more Mr. Nice Guy, no more Mr. Clean." You know, so it's really interesting. Well. My mother-in-law was the first one that brought this up to me, and she says, "You know, I think that's about Ike Smith." who was an apostle oh. and, at the time. And, uh, and Ike Smith was in Arizona. And Ike Smith knew Vincent Vernier. And I think Vinny was, I wouldn't say he was persecuted, but, you know, being the, you know, not the, the you know, cut, dry guy that he was, I'm sure he probably got side eyes. And I looked online one time, and they were like, oh, yeah, that's about his Mormon bishop. So I said, maybe there's some truth to this. Well, anyways... We actually, just a few months ago, Isaac Smith is no longer an apostle. He is older, and he, st- he just decided to step down. And it was totally a, a wonderful, it was an honorable thing that he did. He just felt, you know what, somebody can take over my place. I'm getting older. Well, he was in the Detroit area just a few months ago this year. And he had heard about my writing the book. And he act- I think he actually read the manuscript. Um, and he actually, because I gave it to the apostles as, a, as just as an honorary thing before the book was published. So that way they could see the manuscript. Even though you know, it went through editing and we did final edits, I just let them see, this is what the majority of what's coming out, just so you have a heads up. Um, he, I think he read it, as far as I know, and uh, he wanted to meet with me and have dinner with my wife and I, which was really fun, and my daughter. So we go to a, friend, a, a, a family friend between the both of us, and we have dinner together, and we're talking, and my wife just out of the blue says, okay, 
let me ask you this. Are you the Mr. Smithy in the Alice Cooper song that punches him in the nose? And then Ike Smith's wife just bursts out laughing and says, I believe her Bonnie, she says, that's where it comes from. She, they didn't, as far as we know, they didn't know. Apparently people had been telling them that reference and they didn't really fully realize where it was coming from. <laughs> so my wife was like, guess maybe was the first bold one to flat out say, hey, are you the guy that punched him in the nose? So go Laura. That was awesome of her. And he said, he goes, oh, he goes, oh my goodness. He goes, oh, Vinny. And he basically, or something like that, just very friendly and laughing. And he says, just for the record, I did not punch Vinny in the nose. <laughs> So, yeah, and I guess we have a, a friend that's uh, part of the Latter-day Saint movement. I had met him one time at a John Whitmer historical conference. I forget his name. Really nice guy. Well, anyways, he uh, knows Ike Smith as well and his, his wife, Bonnie. Well, anyways, they go to, they, he went to an Alice Cooper, I don't know if it was a meet and greet or a concert or something like that, and they took a picture with Alice Cooper, and he told him, saying, hey, I know Ike Smith. And Alice said to him, tell Vinny, I, tell, tell, tell Ike Vinny said hi. So, <laughs> so there's a history between there, and it's very possible. It's very possible that sarcastically, I, you'd have to ask Vincent Fernier himself. Yeah, you'll have to get him on the show, but you will have to ask him if that is a reference to Ike Smith as a just a funny little sarcastic little, ha-ha, I went to church incognito, and everybody rose. And Mr. Smith, you recognize me and punch me in the nose. So we'll have to ask him, but I think it is. I think it is, because who else would it be? That's with his one little bicker tonight, I believe, add into the, the song. But who knows? You'll have to ask him. I could be wrong. But let's believe it is. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Daniel Stone. In our next conversation, we'll talk about speaking in tongues. This was an early bicker tonight practice. Is it true that it predates Pentecostal Church's practice of the same? Do they still practice it today? Dr. Daniel Stone gives an interesting answer. The Bicker Tonights predate the Pentecostal movement, like we were saying earlier, and it's very similar what the Pentecostals do. They believe in speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophecy, and the Bicker Tonights believe that as well. I hope you enjoyed that short clip from our next interview. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please go to our patreon.com slash gospel tangents and subscribe for just $5 a month. If you'd like a transcript of this, please click the yellow subscribe button at gospeltangents.com and I'll send you this and all future transcripts. Also, if you'd like a paperback like we've got here, those are available at our website at amazon.com. Just do a search for gospel tangents. Please get all updates at our Facebook page at facebook.com slash gospel tangents. We're also on Twitter at Gospel Tangents. You can also get transcripts individually at our website, gospeltangents.com shop. Finally, make sure that you subscribe on our Apple podcast page. Just do a quick search for uh, Gospel Tangents there and give us a five-star review while you're at it. Thanks again for listening. Your support helps create more Mormon history classes and podcasts such as this. And so I really appreciate you listening. Please share with your friends. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our great videos. Thanks again.